What's going on guys, welcome back. And today we are going to be looking at how KFC became to be. Let's go. Alrighty. How KFC was made from a gas station chicken recipe. Hmm. Let's see. Let's do this. Announcing the portable Sunday dinner by Colonel Sanders. He cooks up Kentucky Fried Chicken in his kitchen, then packs it up in his handy bucket. All you do is pick it up. Imagine, the best meal of the week travels everywhere, every day of the week. Okay, Colonel, hit the road. Making the perfect fried chicken as we know it, juicy <laughs> on the inside, crispy on the outside, used to be a luxury because of how long it took to make. But a man named Harlan Sanders changed that after mastering his own recipe and shortening the cooking time from 30 minutes to under 10. A survivor wow. of the Great Depression and World War II, he journeyed across the U.S. to start a franchise. After being rejected over a thousand times, he went from being given $105 from Social Security checks to millions of dollars for his franchise. Welcome to Hook. And immediately back then, in the very back, we had two bedrooms and a bathroom there, you see. On September 9th of 1890, Harlan was born on a farm, three miles from Henryville, Indiana. When he was six years old, his father passed away. His mother had no choice but to work, sewing for other families and peeling tomatoes at a canning factory. Announcing the portable Sunday dinner. By married a man who didn't like the idea of having cigarette meat. Some days, he would stay up until 11 or 11.30 at night cooking. Hmm. When he turned 10, he got his first job working on a farm. So basically, he's a Midwestern boy. He basically just did his own thing. Okay. As a kid, he got easily distracted by the animals and was fired after just a month. Wow. His mother asked if he would ever amount to anything in life. She said to him, Here you are, my oldest son. Your father is dead, and you're the only one I can look to for help with the other children. And you're no account. You can't even hold a job for two dollars a month. Ashamed from disappointing her, he told himself that he would work harder the next time he got a job. When he was 12 years old, his mother married a man who didn't like the idea of having stepchildren. So after a year, he left home and worked on a farm again. Hmm. He got up before dawn to feed the animals, went to school during the day, and did odd jobs in the evening. Some nights, he shucked corn until about 8 or 9 at night. When he was 13 years old, he started 7th grade and dropped out after 2 weeks. He found algebra too difficult. He continued to work on a farm for 2 years before pursuing several different jobs. He worked as a streetcar conductor, soldier, railroad fireman, insurance salesman, steamboat operator, lighting manufacturer, tire seller, and a lawyer. At one so basically he had a lot of careers, but what actually got him rich was Kentucky Fried Chicken. At one point, his first wife, Josephine King, left him with their children because he got fired so many times. It wasn't until he started working as a gas station operator that his luck changed. In 1924, he hitchhiked from Louisville to Winchester after job hunting. He was picked up by the general manager of Standard Oil Kentucky, an oil and gas company. Hmm. Harlan didn't know who he was at the time and told him what he had been through and why he didn't have a job. So he asked Harlan if he was interested in running a gas station in Nicholasville. Harlan didn't hesitate to say yes. In the early days, the business was slow since customers were loyal to the last person who ran the station. Some people in the town wouldn't even look his way. So Harlan decided to focus on customer service and always offered something extra. Eventually, he earned more than $12,000 a month from selling gas, which was three times more than anyone else had ever sold. Hmm. But his luck took a turn for the worse when the Great Depression hit America. To make rent, Harlan sold his own equipment. He realized that there was no point in staying, so he quit. Fortunately, another oil and gas company, Shell, asked him to run a gas station that was being built in Corbin. He knew it was the only other way he could make money again, so he accepted their offer and moved to Corbin in 1930. To make extra money, Harlan sometimes made meals for customers and had a single table that could seat six people. At first, he only made country ham, string beans, okra, hot biscuits, and later added fried chicken, which became his bestseller. In his memoir, he wrote, I believe that fried chicken is North America's hospitality dish. I spelt all of those words with capital letters. 
By 1937, his food became so popular by word of mouth that people came to visit him from different states. So he expanded his gas station to include a motel and cafe that could seat 142 people. Around this time, he had discovered a huge problem. He couldn't pan fry the chicken fast enough. When he cooked the chicken after an order was placed, the customer had to wait 30 minutes. If he made a batch in advance, he often had to throw away pieces at night. The only other option was deep frying, immersing the chicken in a wire basket in deep fat. While it cooked the chicken faster, it made it dry, crusty, and unevenly done. Yeah. But after discovering a pressure cooker, a new invention at the time, and using it for cooking his vegetables, he made a historic breakthrough. He came up with the idea of using the new invention for cooking his chicken too. After many experiments, he found the right balance of pressure, cooking time, meat, fat, and fat filtration. The pressure cooker sealed in the chicken's flavor, preserved its moisture, and gave it a soft finish that wasn't greasy or crusty. It cut down the cooking time to 8 or 9 minutes. Wow. At the time, he was still refining the seasoning. He started with pepper and salts and ended up making several different kinds. Then one day, he got an order for 500 fried chicken meals. 500? Since they weren't for his regular customers, he decided to try a new seasoning. It turned out to be the best fried chicken he had ever had in his life. So he stuck with it and called it his secret blend of 11 herbs and spices. Not long after, his restaurant was listed in the book Adventures in Good Eating, a mm. Duncan Hines book, Good Eating Places Along the Highways of America. But in 1939, his luck took a turn for the worse again. After building a second motel and cafe in Asheville, his first one in Corbin burnt down on Thanksgiving. By the time oh, it was tour. rebuilt, there weren't any more tourists or vacationers around because of World War II. So he sold his Asheville location and started working for other restaurants and cafeterias. When the war was over, Harlan started another restaurant in Georgetown and allowed a former colleague to run it. He gave him $300 a month and half of the profits. Despite Harlan's okay. generosity, his former colleague turned against him. He opened the restaurant as a partnership with both their names behind Harlan's back, so Harlan had to buy him out to fire him. In 1953, Harlan received a call from a real estate agent who offered him $164,000 in cash for his motel and cafe. Harlan turned him down. His motel and cafe was right on the highway and 90% of his business came from tourists. Still, the agent called him the next day and tried to convince him again. In his memoir, he wrote, There was no point in selling out. My motel was right on the highway. That in itself was worth a fortune. Yeah. I was just as happy as I could be. With business booming, Harlan thought he was set for life. But six months later, he regretted his decision not to sell. A highway junction in front moved to... Okay, I'm going to tell you this right now. It seems like Colonel Sanders was an idiot. He, um... He doesn't realize... Like, look at it. He went up and down, up and down, up and down. Even though there's so many of these downsides, some of them could have been avoided. This is one of them. Dumbass. Another site and cut down the flow of traffic. Afterwards, it was announced that a new interstate highway would bypass it altogether. Harlan was convinced that his business was doomed. So in 1956, he auctioned it off for $75,000, less than half of what the real estate agent offered. Should have taken it. At 66 years old, he had to live off his savings and social security checks of $105 a month. But he had a new business idea, a fried chicken franchise called Kentucky Fried Chicken. In okay. fact, he already had some lined up. Years before, Harlan taught his good friend Pete Herman how to cook his chicken. When Pete served it in his restaurant, business went up by 75%. So Harlan lined up a few more franchises, all before the highway changed. When he decided to pursue this path, he put a couple pressure cookers and a bag of seasoning in his car and hit the road. If he came across a decent looking restaurant, he would beg the owner to let him cook his chicken for the employees. If they were impressed, he offered to stay for a couple of days and cook for the restaurant, hoping that it would lead to another franchise opportunity. To cover his travel expenses, he would get free meals from his friends and slept in the back seat of his car. Wow. In his memoir, he wrote, Looking back, it seems now that one of the most courageous things I ever did was to start out in my car with a pressure cooker to sell my first Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise. As I say, I had no money except for my monthly social security check, but I had 3,500 brochures printed. I expected wow. to get some inquiries as a result of those brochures, but I don't think I ever got more than two or three. 
Mm. Within a couple of years, Harlan didn't have to make those trips anymore. People went to him instead. He did all the bookkeeping and other paperwork, and his second wife, Claudia Price, mixed, packed, and shipped their secret blend of 11 herbs and spices. Harlan didn't okay. share the recipe with his franchises because he was scared it would fall into the hands of competitors. By 1963, there were over 600 KFC franchises in the US and Canada. Finally, he was financially secure, but he worried about what would become of his company after his death. Over the years, several people asked to buy his company, including a 29-year-old lawyer named John Brown. John's grandfather was a farmer who taught him the same work ethic that Harlan learned two generations earlier. He met Harlan in 1963 when he was asked to become his full-time attorney. After he had said no, the two ended up talking about Harlan's favorite topic, fried chicken. John was amazed to learn <laughs> that course. Harlan had hundreds of franchises around the US and Canada. In an interview, John shared, When I heard that, I imagined that he had salesmen everywhere. I said, Well, Colonel, how many salesmen do you have out in the field? And he said, Oh, we don't solicit. We don't believe in solicitation. He started to think about what would happen if they were more aggressive with sales. But before they parted, he agreed to take over a barbecue franchise that Harlan was planning to build instead. He raised the money he needed from a millionaire named Jack Macy and started learning about the barbecue business. He mm -hmm. discovered that barbecue only had a regional appeal and that the real money was in fried chicken. So he and Jack decided to buy Harlan's company. In 1963, they made their first offer. Harlan said a sale was out of the question. They argued that Harlan should enjoy his life now, and that if he died before selling his franchise, most of his estate would go towards taxes. They offered Harlan $2 million, which would have been over $15 million today. Damn. They also promised to maintain quality and treat his franchises fairly. To Harlan, their proposal made sense, but somehow didn't feel right. It felt like a father selling his child. He took his time to think about it while John continued to try and convince him. On January 6th of 1964, Harlan finally gave in and sold his company. He was 73 years old at the time. Wow. Looking back on his journey, he shared. Well, you know, he, he made some poor decisions. Um, but look at it now. It's all over the U.S. And I don't think you could get any better than that. Anyway, guys, see you guys in my video. Peace out.